Welcome to Skyscape's free webinar series. Today's topic is Next Gen Learning on the Fly, Clinical Judgment for All Nursing Students. I am Kristen Snowden-Smith from Skyscape, and I will be the moderator today. Our speaker today is Dr. Tim Bristol. Tim is a faculty and student success specialist. He works with a number of colleges and universities and resides in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Tim has been utilizing technology in the classroom, clinical, and lab setting for over 20 years. His motto is, today we will learn how to learn. I'll now hand the floor over to Tim. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm really glad to be here today. A lot of exciting uh, developments um, on the front of NCLEX and the whole world of assessing whether or not a person is ready for practice. National Council of State Boards of Nursing, NCSBN, has been doing a lot of work the past couple of years to develop a model of um, a model of cognitive processing, uh, psychomotor processing, affective processing that that describes what a nurse truly needs to be able to do. And they've been sharing this information with us in a couple of different ways. But they they basically come up with this this uh, model here in front of you that. Clinical judgment is the outcome of critical thinking and clinical decision making. Okay, you combine these two areas, and that and that is where that is where the nurse needs to be. Okay, they they kind of say that clinical judgment is the doing part of these 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 uh, uh, cognitive processes. So, as you think about as you think about the the focus on practice, National Council does see a gap between practice and academia. They're seeing errors in, in novice nurses that indicate a lack of clinical judgment. Um, and and there's, there's a continuing growth in complexity in the whole healthcare process. So, so as we look at the future of NCLEX, there's two things that are gonna be happening here soon. First of all, next year, uh, 2019, we do expect the difficulty of NCLEX to increase. Now, when, just a little bit of terminology here for you, a little bit of terminology and background. When I say next generation NCLEX, that is not, that is not what we're gonna be seeing overtly in 2019 uh, as the increase in difficulty, but what we are gonna be seeing is the impact of all the research that National Council is doing on clinical judgment. We're gonna see that impact the current NCLEX, okay? And, and we, we are anticipating an increase in difficulty next year in the NCLEX, especially for the RN. Now, in the not too far distant future, in the not too distant future, we are going to see some changes in NCLEX. We don't know exactly what they're going to be. NCLEX has given us a few clues. They've given us a few ideas. But when it comes to assessment, they've created a new model that is going to dictate the change and the, the, the progression and the evolution of NCLEX over the next couple of years. And so this model, you can learn more about it at this website. Um, when you go to the National Council website, you'll see you, you, you can actually type in next generation NCLEX. You'll get, uh, I think there's like seven or eight documents there that talk about what they've been up to, some of the samples that they've been using. Um, if you're going to an NCLEX invitational uh, for faculty, they're going to start talking more and more about this. And they've been describing what new types of NCLEX questions might look like, okay? But the framework for this change is, is what they, they call their clinical judgment process, and there's five steps here. Cue recognition, hypothesis generation, hypothesis evaluation, taking action, and evaluating outcomes. Now, some of you are sitting here going, uh, excuse me, isn't this just the nursing process with a new coat of paint? <laughs> that was my initial reaction. But I think what you're gonna what you're going to appreciate as you review some of the documents at their website as we have our discussion today, I think what you're gonna appreciate is in the nursing process, we talk a lot more about fact. Okay, when we when you look at those five chapters, if you will, in, in the fundamentals textbook on nursing process, assess plan, implement, 
uh, assess, plan, analyze, implement, uh, evaluate. When you look at the ad pie, <laughs> when you look at the AA pie, depending on which one you want to use, um, you're going to see a lot more talk about fact. When you look at this clinical judgment process, you're going to see a lot more talk about processing, a lot more talk about higher order thinking right out of the gate. Let's go ahead and dive in here. First of all, cue recognition. Cue recognition being, do you, do you appreciate what's going on in this clinical scenario? Can you prioritize the cues? Can you effectively pick out which cues are of concern and which are not? Okay, we realize that many mistakes are made in the healthcare system by missing that important cue. And when we allow students, when we allow students to make a list of 20 things that are important in this clinical picture, you know what happens? They miss the top three. Whereas when we say to students, hey, what are your top three assessment concerns right now? Either what are the top three things you have to assess right now, or of all the assessment data you've collected, what are your three most important ones? And, and so when we, when we talk about this, it's important that students do a lot of this in class, okay? Um, what information is an indication of improvement? What, indi what information is an indication of worsening? And, and the sample of this next generation NCLEX, the sample question looks like this. They actually create a chart. And I, I apologize, I don't have an image to show you, but if you go to their website, you'll see some of this. Um, they, they have a chart and they list a number of different cues, also known as assessment data, such as clubbing of the, uh, uh, of the digits, uh, vital signs, you know, um, a statement by a client, okay? And so pulse, uh, a pulse rate of, a heart rate of 80, is this cue unrelated to the, to the client's uh, condition or change in condition? Is it a sign of improvement? Is it a sign of worsening? What does the pulse of 80 mean to this client? And then you have a blood pressure of 110 over 70. What does it mean to this patient? Is it unrelated improvement, worsen, a sign of improvement, worsening? This, this patient said, I just can't do this anymore. Is that statement by the patient unrelated to the client's uh, situation? Is it a sign of improvement in the client's condition is it a sign of worsening. The students are going to be, it, this is going to be a challenge for them. And, and what I want you to start to, is we have this discussion. What is so important for you to consider is we're having this discussion, not, it, we, we can't worry about the NCLEX right now, okay? You, you can't worry about it what, right now. What you have to be thinking about is tomorrow, I'm going to be in lecture with 80 students teaching mental health, or tomorrow I'm going to be in a clinical agency with eight students on a telemetry unit. I want you to be thinking about tomorrow, okay? Because yes, we are concerned about the NCLEX. Yes, our school has to get a certain benchmark pass rate on the NCLEX, but NCLEX is changing so much fundamentally you have to begin intervening tomorrow. You have to begin talking to the students differently tomorrow. You have to begin implementing change in the lesson plan tomorrow. We're not going to be able to, to wait and, and, and figure out, hey, uh, our, our, uh, what kind of questions, what are the questions going to look like on the NCLEX? A big part of this research, let me pause our discussion on the five steps for just a moment. A big part of the research that National Council is doing, a big part of the investment that they're making, is that the test taker, also known as the candidate, will not be able to answer the test, that, that question, using a trick, using a test-taking strategy. They're not going to be able to answer these questions anymore with with test taking tips and tricks and test taking strategies. National Council wants to actually assess this individual as if they were standing next to a patient, as if they were the woman here in the blue scrubs in this picture. 
looking at a patient, talking to a patient, and they're trying to develop assessment strategies that do just that. So, so yes, I am interested in what these questions are going to look like on the next generation of NCLEX, but you have to understand what's going to help your students next time in, in the next graduating class, what's gonna help them pass NCLEX is, is actually turning every lecture into a clinical experience, is actually taking them deep in every lab experience, is actually having these overt discussions about priority cues, priority assessment in every clinical experience. Starting from day one of fundamentals, we've got to help them train this way. Practice often, practice early, starting in fundamentals. We can't wait, we can't do things like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait until they have a bunch of information memorized, then I'll start on this cue recognition discussion or this clinical judgment discussion. We have to start early. We have to start showing them this prioritization early. Another sidebar here for you. National Council does research on, on thousands of new nurses every three years. And that research every time shows that the most important class in the entire curriculum is fundamentals. That's not gonna change with the next generation of NCLEX. That's not gonna change with the new NCLEX coming out next year. What, what you're going to see is fundamentals has to be taught at a higher level. Okay, so, so this is why I'm advocating for, let's focus on clinical judgment. Yes, even in the first, very first nursing class. This is, a, this is an example of one. Um, you have three patients here with Crohn's disease. For each patient scenario, what is most concerning, okay? Now, this is where we create three patient scenarios of, of patients with Crohn's disease. And maybe in one scenario, we list some lab values and a statement by the patient, I just can't go on anymore. This, you see, the, the nurse, the nurse has to prioritize. Is that statement by the patient, I just can't go on anymore? Or is the potassium of 3.1 more concerning? You see what I did there? I didn't give you a potassium of 2.5 putting them in imminent danger of a cardiac event. I put it on the edge. And, and that statement, I just can't go on anymore. That's what's gonna happen here with cue recognition because in the real clinical environment, that's what's happening. That's the reality. Our students have to look at a set of data and constantly be in that prioritization mindset. They can't just look at a set of data and go, oh, there's hypokalemia, cool. I know what hypokalemia is. You can't do that. You have to move them beyond that much quicker. Um, when we're talking about cue recognition and using some of this verbiage, you need to be overt about it in the lab, in the simulation, in the clinical. As we have our discussion here today, I hope to show you some examples of how to do that, some tools how to do that. But here's one very simple one. Students, I need you to get out a three by five card. And I need you to actually write these words on this three by five note card. For your client today, what are three things that you can delegate and why? What are three things you cannot delegate and why? And I need you to present this to a peer for feedback. Now, we're talking about cue recognition. We're talking about forming habits, being able to manage multiple cues coming at you. What does the outcome of that look like? Well, one of the outcomes is delegation. Are you able to delegate appropriately? Can you take all these cues in and delegate appropriately? And many times in many curricula, we treat delegation as a unit to be covered, assessed, one time in a program or one time in a class. You can't do that anymore. With clinical judgment, we've got to figure out ways of helping students build habits. So for instance, they write these words on this note card. And then literally during class, literally during class, maybe it's with these patients, these three patients with Crohn's disease, okay? You have them treat 
you have them treat those patients as if they were actually in a clinical setting with those patients and they start having discussions. I'm caring for this patient with Crohn's disease on an inpatient unit who has these vitals, these lab values, has made these statements. What can I delegate for their care? What can I not delegate for their care? And then I talk to a peer about that. Now this note card you created students, it's not just for lecture today in GI Med Surge. It's also for this afternoon when you go to your mental health lecture. And it's also for tomorrow when you have your simulation. And it's also for uh, Monday when you're back in clinical on the telemetry unit. You're gonna take this card with you to all three of those settings, all of those settings. And be sure to bring it back to lecture next week to this class because we're gonna use it again. That's how you build habits of Q recognition. I also like to show students how to use these tools in their own study time, okay? How to use multiple tools together in their own study time. So students, I'd like you to go ahead and get out Get out your, your iPad, get out your cell phone. We had you buy your NCLEX review book and Skyscape on your phone. I'd like you to open that up and, and open up your NCLEX review app and click study, then go to the case study for that particular area that we're studying. In this case, it's the prenatal period, okay? I want you to look at that case study, all right? Now, I want you, to open up your lab guide and I'd like you to create three lab values that indicates this patient's situation is improving. Three lab values. And then I'd like you to create three lab values that indicates this patient's situation is worsening. Do you see what I'm doing? National Council has said they're going to ask questions similar to that, okay? I don't look at that and go, oh, I've got to change my exam. I look at that and go, oh, I've got to show students how to do this repeatedly while they're studying, while they're in lecture, while they're in lab, while they're in clinical. I've got to help them start to train their clinical judgment muscle in that way. And the students do just that. They open up their lab guide and, and they, you know, and sometimes we'll tell them which labs to create create a potassium, create a sodium, create a hemoglobin. Other times, we'll have them go the step of picking which labs they need to create that indicate improvement, that indicate worsening. This idea of create is a very powerful way to learn. And, and faculty, if you're teaching fundamentals, think about it. Think about it. Students, I gave you a 20-minute video to watch before class on on blood pressure, how to measure blood pressure, what's appropriate for blood pressure, blood pressure across the lifespan, okay? Now you're in class. And now I've given you this patient scenario. And now you students create a blood pressure that indicates the client's condition is worsening. You create a blood pressure that indicates the client's condition is improving. You see, allow the students to create. The next step that they talk about is hypotheses generation. And again, you're gonna see a lot of discussion about prioritize here, okay? What needs to be done to get the best outcomes for the client? Here's where we start the planning phase. And, and we start about what, what, what actions am I gonna take? Now, the examples they talk about is an extended drag and drop and, and you're no longer going to, in the good old days on NCLEX and, and the current NCLEX we're in, a lot of times that drag and drop, what we would hear about is, I had to put the correct steps in order to doing a particular skill. National Council is moving way beyond that now. And, and this extended drag and drop um, is, is more of a, a prioritization of concerns, more of a prioritization of which patient you're going to see first. Um, there's a lot of prioritization here as you're as you're trying to create a list of things that need to be done. What are priority needs? It's, and, and sometimes it'll be care of one patient. Sometimes it'll be care of multiple patients. Sometimes it'll be plans for entire teams. Faculty, I hope you hear me. 
this has got to be done in class. This has to be a part of lecture. We've got to come up with strategies to do this. And, and, and then we compare, okay, I've created a list of priority, I've hypothesized my priority list, if you will. Now we have to compare what we've created here with the evidence base. We've got to train our brains that I always quickly go to that evidence base. And, and in a number of my other webinars, I talk a lot about evidence-based practice on the fly. If you're with me in a face-to-face -face conference, um, uh, Vegas, Minneapolis, Orlando, you're actually going to see us using our devices to do this evidence-based practice on the fly. You don't just create a list of priority needs and cross your fingers and hope it's part of the up-to-date evidence base. You actually check the evidence base. You compare the list you've created of needs with the client's needs. What are the priorities for the client right now? Again, back to our example with patient with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, IBD. You've got to, you've got to say what truly is a priority for this patient right now? No longer are we going to be allowed to live inside of one pathology when it comes to prioritizing patient care. Now, many of you are sitting here thinking, boy, Tim, you're nuts. You don't know how much information I have to cover in class. You don't know how much, how much work we have to do to just get through what we're doing already. I hear you. I hear you. We're probably going to run out of time today, if you will. Um, You've got to allow the students to be receiving feedback multiple times a day in class, multiple times a day in lab, multiple times a day in clinical. And the best way to do this is have them working with peers and giving each other feedback multiple times a day. The students should not be surprised when we tell them, you're not doing a good job at prioritizing your assessments. They shouldn't be surprised when the faculty gives them that feedback either on an exam, in a care plan, in clinical, because daily they're prioritizing assessments and getting feedback from peers, okay? So we've gotta find ways of making that peer interaction a part of this as they're, um, as they're uh, evaluating this whole process. This is an example of another question that National Council talks about will be a part of the next generation NCLEX. They list on, on the left side of the computer screen three patient scenarios, okay? And they'll be somewhat related, but somewhat different. You know, maybe it's a, a, a sexually active 21 year old female uh, who smokes. Maybe it's a um, uh, a 45-year-old female, Nella Paris, whose husband has been uh, a coal miner for many years. And maybe, you know, and, and then there's a third patient. And then on the right side of the screen will be three different target areas. One target area is labeled a patient most at risk for cervical cancer, a patient most at risk for lung cancer, a patient most at risk for ovarian cancer, okay? And they literally, the student literally has to click and drag the scenario or the title of that scenario into the correct target. That's an example. That's an example of this extended drag and drop, this, this, this National Council's attempt to not allow test-taking tips, test-taking uh, tricks, strategies to be the focus. And, and as we're looking at the next generation of NCLEX, the students have got to be able to create these priorities on their own. When we're doing this in class, when we're doing this in class, the students have got to compare what they've discovered with a peer. When you're talking about evaluating your hypotheses, when you're talking about generating a hypothesis and evaluating it, the students have got to do it. They've got to be about doing it themselves. And again, and I've, I've mentioned this many times before, here's where we use a clinical tool in class. Here's where they get out their clinical decision support tool. In this particular case, uh, I believe this is my clinical companion. Uh, the students open it up and on their phone, they evaluate how did they do with planning? So they've come up, they've generated some hypotheses 
And now they're looking at that evidence base. They've actually got to do this. When it comes to, when it comes to taking notes, okay, and, and we want them to do this process as well. When you look at the Nurse Think Notes notebook, you're going to see this process is very overt. They're going to do a lot of compare and contrast. The notebook itself is not going to ask them for what are a bunch of facts. What the notebook is going to do is take them into that compare and contrast right away. So as they're reading, they're, they're looking for cues, but they're looking for priority cues. As they're in lecture, they're looking for priority cues. They're looking for, as they're generating their hypotheses, what are priority hypotheses? They're doing a lot of compare and contrast. And, and when they use a notebook like this, uh, and, and, and you can see this, you see the numbers one, two, three. The whole goal here is not to say, what are the assessments that you do for a patient with Crohn's disease? The, the, the goal here is to say, what are the priority assessments? What cues must you look for? Or if, if they have their notebook out when they're looking at those three patients with Crohn's disease, they have their notebook out and they're actually going, okay, you know what? For this particular patient, I think here's the priorities, but for this other patient, here's a different set of priorities. So that priority assessment, priority intervention. And if you're not using the Nurse Think Note notebooks, that's not a problem. You can create this on your own. But the take home message is we've got to figure out ways of making this doing part, this doing part of the cognitive processing, the clinical judgment, we've got to make it a habit. And if you think about taking notes, that's where we develop a lot of our habits. Now, a beauty of the notebook, it allows them to really develop their habits well. In the front of the notebook is a table of contents and an index. And the app for this is going to come out um, here in the next couple of months. But the, the idea here is, because of the table of contents, because of the index, they keep going back to the same page of notes. They keep building on what they already have. A big barrier to developing your clinical judgment skills is feeling like every time you encounter something, you have to start all over or you have to memorize a new list of facts. Whereas if, if I keep going back to the same page of notes, you'll notice this particular is page 13. And, and if you looked at in, in the index of the book, it would tell you what's on page 13. But, but the beauty of this is you get to build habits across the curriculum. You get to take your notebook to class. You get to use your notebook when you're studying. You get to use it in lab, use it in clinical. Anytime a patient comes across your radar with Crohn's disease, you're going to open up to the exact same page of notes and build on what you already have. And, and that's just a very powerful way to, to work. It's a very powerful way to study. It goes right to the heart of this clinical judgment discussion. Now, what about taking action? Okay, remember, clinical judgment is the doing part of critical thinking and clinical decision making. Anytime I'm working with students in an NCLEX review, we always, we always talk about what is the nurse going to do? It, it, that, NCLEX has always been a doing exam, okay? Take home message faculty, when you're teaching class, your students have got to be doing something. They've got to be exercising their clinical judgment muscles. What is, the highest priority, how do I address the highest priority right now as a nurse? Faculty, let me give you a little word of caution here. If you're teaching prioritization with a PowerPoint slide that has the word priorities of care, and then there's five, 10, 15 bullets on that slide of priorities of care, what you've done is you've decreased the student's ability to develop their priority, prioritization, clinical judgment muscles. You've hindered their learning. What you need to do is have a PowerPoint slide that says priorities of care and has nothing else written on it. And then the students open up their notebook. They go to that page of priority, I'm sorry. Um, they go to that page of priority intervention, priority assessment and they create their list 
the priorities of care, priorities of assessment. When students are taking action, they have to be doing. They can't be receiving. They can't be listening to you tell them what the priorities are. That type of learning will no longer work for students. They're gonna have to take it to the next level. Um, in this particular in this particular activity, um, the students, or I'm sorry, test question example on NCLEX, what happens is the students have a series of buttons and it'll say like, I, I believe the example was 11 o'clock, uh, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. They click a button and, and what they'll see on the computer is what the nurse was doing, what assessments they did, what interventions they did at that particular time. Then they'll click on 12 o'clock, it'll show them. Assessments, interventions, one o'clock, assessments, interventions. Then the question actually asks them, when did the nurse make a mistake? When did the nurse do something incorrect? As in, did they do an assessment that they should have done yet, or did they not do an assessment that they should have done at that time? What did the nurse do that was incorrect? What should the nurse have done? What, what should the nurse have done instead? What, what should they have been about? You see, this is all about the doing part of clinical, this, this is clinical judgment. And the students aren't looking for what's the correct process in trach, trach care, what's the correct steps in trach care. They're not looking for that. They're watching the entire clinical scenario unfold and they have to implement clinical judgment. We've got to do this often in class. We've got to have class time be less of an emphasis in facts, more of an emphasis on concepts and actions. Um, when it comes to the learning part of this, you've got to get the students up out of their seats, okay? Be, be cautious, watch a clock, set an alarm on your phone. If those students are sitting for more than 15 minutes, for more than 20 minutes, if they're sitting in one place, just being a passive recipient, you gotta set that alarm off. You gotta say, okay, it's time to get up out of your seats, pair up, take your phones and open up your clinical companion, review what you wrote in your nurse think notes, go to those priority nursing interventions and, and, and talk about, did you, did you come up with the same priorities as a peer? Did you come up with the same priorities as, as what you see in your clinical companion or what your clinical companion has guided you to do. After reviewing your companion, do at least two assessments on your buddy. Perform at least two interventions on your buddy, on this peer that you're working with. No, don't sit down, students. Nurses don't get to sit down. You see where I'm going with this, right? Even in a lecture hall where I've got 90 students sitting theater style with those little pizza desk things, you know, I'm sorry. It is so important that they get up out of their chair and do something. Yes, you're gonna have to fold up your laptop, stick it back in your backpack, walk out to the aisle, walk down to the front, walk to the back of the room. You've got to do something. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, how am I gonna bring all these skills supplies to class? And on and on it goes, guess what? You don't have to use your clinical imagination students use your clinical imagination and guess what students you've also got to find a new buddy each day now think of what i just talked you through think of the chaos that's a part of this you've got to make some choices are you going to continue to just feed facts to the students or are you going to allow them to engage clinical judgment while they're there with peers, while they're there with you. You gotta go to that clinical judgment piece. And notice, I keep trying to use tools here. They're, they're MedSurge Clinical Companion. That's the book that they're supposed to have with them when they're in the clinical setting, okay? And if the, you know, the clinical agency doesn't let them get out their phone or their iPad or whatever, that's okay. They have to go to the break room or they, you, maybe you bring one iPad that you share with the students on the clinical unit, that's okay. But we've got to build these habits during lecture and we've got to replicate, we've got to use these clinical tools, use these tools that they're going to use in other places. Here's another example. This is a, this is a tool that, that students use in skills. It's called Skills Hub. 
And basically, for each of the skills, it walks them through, you know, what's the, what's the current evidence base on performing this skill? It'll link them to some video. Um, I'll, you know, and, and the other thing I want to point out here, um, when you're looking at tools like this, and I'll talk about it here in just a moment, one of the biggest reasons students don't use their tools to their fullest capacity is because they don't see faculty using their tools. And this is any kind of tool, whether it's the nursing notes notebook, whether it's the whether it's the adaptive quizzing, whether it's the NCLEX review book, whether it's case studies that they've purchased. The number one reason students don't use those tools is because they don't see you using them. So here's an example. Students, get out your skills hub in class. Let's talk through this for a moment. Now you just cared for uh, you just cared for a patient, if you will, and um, I want you to find a skill in your skills hub that addresses that. Oh, look! As you're looking at your skills hub, maybe you're maybe you're practicing. Uh, you're 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 looking through some of the information there in the learn component, and look, you have not yet checked off on that skill, or maybe it says yes, you have checked off on that skill. Oh, this reminds me, we did do this skill last semester. You see what I'm doing? I'm trying to, I'm trying to trigger their memory. I'm trying to make learning enduring across learning environments, across the curriculum by using tools that they've used in multiple places, okay? I never look at a tool like Skills Hub and go, oh, that's only for the lab in fundamentals. Nope. I look at Skills Hub, I look at the Clinical Companion, I look at the notebook, I look at note cards, that three by five card that you just created, and I focus on how can I use this in multiple environments. So one example here, one example is, is you know, using the Skills Hub here, they're going through, they're like, oh yeah, and, and maybe they're reviewing some of the processes on a skill they just completed as part of that clinical judgment activity in class. Maybe they um, give each other a little bit of feedback because they're practicing a skill in lecture. And then the Skills Hub walks them into NCLEX style questions that refer to that skill, okay? And this is, this is powerful. This is a good, way for them to, uh, a good way for them to learn. It's very powerful. Um, and, and maybe they, you can see over here, they got some of the questions wrong. Well, that's good. That's a good thing because now, What's going to actually happen is the students are going to be like, oh, that's right. I remember missing that question. They're going to have some discussion about it. Then the faculty at the front of the room, they actually, the faculty can open up the dashboard, the faculty dashboard for this. And this is a good way to see what students are doing here in class or what they have done. And you can customize the lesson plan. You can say, wait a minute. Hey, let's back up for a moment, even though, yes, we're in. Um, GI Med Surge, let's go back to this particular fundamental skill because I see a number of you had some trouble with it or haven't completed as many of the modules. Or maybe you got a lot of the quiz questions wrong. And I can apply it to what we're learning right now, right here today. You see, fundamentals is the most important class in the curriculum, as I mentioned before. Now you've got data on different parts of fundamentals that they might be weak in or fundamental skills that they might be weak in. And you can emphasize how do I how do I incorporate that in the big picture here? Not just, hey, today we're going to memorize all the facts you need to know about Crohn's disease. And the students can do the same thing. The students can open up their own personal report. And they can focus on their weaknesses. They can focus on questions. In this particular example, um, the green check mark shows that they got question one of chest physiotherapy or, or question one of incentive spirometer correct. But question three on incentive spirometer, they got it correct after multiple tries. Okay. So they can look through this. It gives them feedback and it reminds them of what they've already learned, but it also shows them what their gaps might be very powerful way to learn. Again, just pulling it out a few times in class um, in, in, in weekly is going to help them tremendously. And then again, doing similar activities, um, obviously using it in lab. But think about post-conference. Think about post-conference and clinical. That's going to start tying all these pieces together. That allows them to move through the clinical judgment process better, more effectively. Okay. 
The final part of the clinical judgment, the final step in the clinical judgment process is evaluate outcomes. What cues does the nurse look for? Compare those outcomes against what was expected. Is this outcome what you expected? Start to train your brain to think that way. And, and here's where you see a lot of different types of questions. When, when they talk about, when, when you read National Council's data and, and you look at this evaluate outcome, they're gonna talk about different types of questions. And, and then here they talk about a lot of the ones we've already covered, such as the extended drag and drop. It's not a list anymore. You literally could put two items next to each other, as in which two patients are gonna go in this room together. Um, extended multiple response, this is where it moves through a scenario. So it's not just one, so multiple response is National Council's way of describing select all that apply. In this particular, um, in this particular situation, it goes through a scenario that's unfolding and keeps added, asking select all that apply questions. And this is where you might say, what are the priority assessments? What are the priority interventions going through that scenario? Um, so these are just a couple of um, a, a couple of the examples of what that might look like, what those questions might look like. As I wrap up this part of our discussion, though, I really hope that you see this is way more than a discussion about what next generation NCLEX is going to look like, or about the difficulty increasing on the NCLEX in the near future. This is a discussion about how you can change your class change your lab, change your clinical experience tomorrow. I really hope you'll consider that. Help students take ownership, okay? Um, you know, and, and a lot of times this, we need to do some role modeling here, okay? A lot of times we need to do some role modeling. I hear it a lot, Tim, I can't teach this way because the students are not prepped for class, okay? Or the students didn't do their homework, so I can't teach this way. Well, we've got to do two things. First of all, we can't enable that behavior. And when you say things like, I know you guys didn't have time to prepare for class, so I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the pathophysiology of Crohn's disease. What you've just said to them is prep for class really isn't that important, really doesn't matter a whole lot because I'm gonna fill in the gap for you anyways. And now because we're spending 20 minutes covering the pathophysiology of Crohn's disease, do you know what's gonna be, you know what's gonna be lacking? You've just taken away 20 minutes from those students of developing their clinical judgment skills. So we've got, we can't enable them. We've gotta be careful with that. And, we'll, and when we expect them to prepare for class, you know, so for instance, what I will tell my students is, hey, um, we're doing GI med surge next week in, in lecture. I'd like you to open up your NCLEX review book before you come to class next week and take that practice quiz on GI med surge. You need to know what you don't know before you get here because when you come to class, you will get a patient assignment and you've got to be ready to start caring for that patient. So that's what I say to the students, but what do I do? What do I do? I say, go use that NCLEX review tool, go, go do those NCLEX questions, and, and they've, got to, they've got to see that I really value that by me taking some time in class to show them exactly what I'm talking about. And this, you know, and, and this really helps the students save time studying too when you do this for them, when you open up those tools in class, because a lot of times they'll sit at home, they'll waste a lot of time studying, doing things that don't work for them. Or, or, or thinking, yeah, he mentioned that NCLEX review book, but he never uses it in class, so I shouldn't waste my time using it. Well, guess what? Had they used the NCLEX review book, had they used the, the adaptive quizzing that came with their MedSearch textbook, they would have saved so much time studying because then they would know what they don't know. They'd know how to study more effectively. And when you, when you ask students, you know, how do you know what you don't know? They're like, uh, well, maybe I'll do bad on the exam next week. Look, students don't wait. You've got to start practicing now. You've got to create your, you, you've got to start creating assessments that focus on your areas of weakness. Um, you can't just, you can't just assume that you need everything that you're looking at. And this really empowers the students because 
as you're showing them how to do this practice, how to practice this know what you don't know with their tools, um, it really allows them to go right to their areas that they need to spend time on. Your students don't have a lot of time to sit around and guess, okay, maybe I should just read for two more hours. For many of your students, reading is not effective studying because their reading comprehension skills are so poor. And so we've got to show them how to get to that information that they need so that when they come to class, we can go right to that clinical judgment. And there's a lot of tools out there, even now um, in, the, um, in the testing, uh, the practice testing that we have in Skyscape, they can actually ask an expert and if they get a question wrong and get, get feedback from an expert on, you know, hey, maybe, maybe you misunderstood the question or maybe you misunderstood this part of the question. It's a very powerful way to learn. As we go through these five steps of clinical judgment, again, I hope you reflect on what you can do in class, what you can do in lab, what can be done in clinical, um, what can be done in multiple semesters, okay? When it comes to learning and building habits, especially habits of clinical judgment, it does help if there's some familiarity across the curriculum. And the students, you know, when the students go from my med surge class to your mental health class, do they feel like they let, just left one planet and went to a different planet? If we're doing, if we're doing using similar tools, okay, if we're using similar tools in these classes, a lot of times it helps build in so much comfort that the student is able to get closer to their clinical judgment goals much quicker. Okay, it's a very powerful, powerful way to learn, and I, I really hope that you'll consider that. All right, I apologize, went a little over there, but um, questions, thoughts, ideas, concerns? If you have questions, anyone in the audience, please post them in the chat window and we will answer them. Quiet audience today. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to, um, let's see. What do those that are using other services uh, like ATI or Kaplan or HESI need to change or add our student preparation before the graduation? In other words, how do we simulate the NCLEX test experience? How do you simulate the NCLEX test experience? Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you some pointers on that, but I want to... I want to make sure you understand first, no matter what you're using, ATI, Kaplan, HESI, no matter what tools you're using, um, it, it, NCLEX, the, the direction NCLEX is headed and, and what we're going to see even next April when we get a new NCLEX uh, implemented, um, it's more about what happens in the classroom. So if you're using, for instance, ATI and there's the um, ATI skills modules, you need to use those in class and use them often and make sure that the students are doing clinical judgment with those tools. They're doing things with those tools in class. Um, you know, so that's really important. It's, it's really important that the, the activities that the students are doing in class to passing in class, because whether you have ATI, Kaplan, HESI, using the NLN tools for standardized testing, it's, it's about learning. It's, it's not about testing. And, and National Council's doing a pretty good job. They're doing a pretty good job now of creating more and more test items that really assess that at a deeper level. Now, um, back to preparing them for the testing experience. The best way to prepare for the testing experience is to do that practice quizzing often. Um, if it's the testing experience that you're, you're truly focused on as in the day that they arrive to the Pearson View Testing Center and, and check in and do the palm vein scan and sit down to the computer and use the whiteboard. Um, you know, and I have an NCLEX update where I talk about some of that um, that, that you can access, but the best, the best thing to do for them is to have them assessing themselves often with the quizzing tools that they're, that they're using. So um, I, I really prefer the, um, uh, the, the, the testing experience with that, the Saunders uh, NCLEX app, that does a great job. Um, truth be known, they can do it with just about anything. Now, 
when we're practicing to take NCLEX, a mistake that many students make is put the, the testing tool in study mode, as in I answer the question and I instantly get feedback on that question. That's a problem. That's a problem because you're training your brain to automatically find out how it did. How did I do, How brain, how did I do on this question? I'm gonna get instant feedback. The NCLEX is not like that. And you have to be careful studying in study mode. You wanna study more in exam mode where it gives you 20 questions, then you hit submit, then you only focus on the questions you got wrong. Or it gives you 50 questions or 100 questions or whatever. It doesn't give you the answer every single time because that trains your brain. And then what happens, you're sitting in the NCLEX, you, you answer a question and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I got it right or wrong. And then you answer another question, your stress level goes up even more. And the third question and a fourth and a 75th question and a question number 125. And all this stress has built up in you because you're used to hitting submit and getting instant feedback. So I would say that that, that would be one caution that I, that I do see. Good question though. Uh, another question we have is, uh, if teaching an, uh, an online program that doesn't meet for lecture, how do you recommend implementing these strategies into practice? Um, this, is where, this is where them creating priority lists becomes very, very important. Um, I mentioned the um, Nurse Think Notes notebook. You can take a look at that. Um, you can have them create priority lists in your discussion boards. Um, many of your discussion boards have a feature where they can't see what other people post until they post their own. And that's important to enact that feature. Um, and then I think that when you have online classes, um, it's okay. It's okay to say to the students, students, you have to meet with another group of students on the phone, on Skype. Um, here's three options uh, per week or per two weeks. You've got to meet and have some verbal discussions about this. That is okay, especially if it's a pre-licensure experience. I think it's really important. In the pre-licensure experience that is fully online, you've got the lab experiences that you, that you come together face-to-face. -face. You have the clinical experiences that you come together face-to-face. -to -face. The instructors, the faculty, the preceptors in those environments need some, need some cueing on how to do some of this, but the students have got to have these in-depth prioritization discussions. Good question. Okay, thank you. Um, another one is, um, if you were a graduate from years ago where learning was done in a clinical setting and you were in clinicals for two to four days a week, um, maybe you weren't good at test taking, but you were really great at prioritizing and delegating. Do you think it, it's a good practice for a program to maybe add more clinical time to the curriculum versus classroom work? I, I We have a staff can, that's stuck on PowerPoint lectures. What do you, sure. advice do you have to help encourage them to move towards interactive learning? Yes, yes, I, I totally hear you. I get where you're coming from. I am always an advocate for more clinical time uh, whenever possible. My son just graduated with his BSN. I was just, I, I couldn't believe the lack of clinical time and, you know, and it's, and it's constraints. I know that in some states, um, your, your curriculum, your, your board of nursing, your department of ed is cutting credits out of your program and we've got all kinds of constraints in academia to deal with. So yes, if possible, that additional clinical time as long as your, your, your additional clinical time, these faculty are having overt discussions about cue recognition, prioritization, priority assessment, priority intervention. The students should hear those words in their sleep because so many faculty are talking about it. I have, I do a lot of clinical observations of faculty and the word priority assessment, priority intervention, these do not come up a lot. It, it, you'll have students randomly rattle off a hundred things thinking if I just give this instructor more words and, and instructors accept that sometimes. So, so yes, more clinical would be wonderful, but reality is 
you're probably not going to get it. What has to happen, the discussions we have to start having, is that class time needs to become clinical time. Your classroom time, your classroom lecture time, the students have got to get patient assignments during lecture and care for patients during lecture. And the model that I just walked you through gives you a lot of framework for doing that. I get it. It's easier to be attached to my PowerPoint and just talk through it. I get it. I understand where you're headed with that. And, and sometimes that's a problem and sometimes faculty have trouble with that. But it's not going to work. And if, if that's the student's primary mode of learning with you, your students are going to struggle mightily when the new NCLEX comes online and they're going to struggle even more when the next generation of NCLEX becomes integrated. So. Thank you, Tim. Uh, another question we have is how would you correlate the lab and the clinical into online didactic? Can you repeat that? I, I'm not sure I follow. Um, the question is how would you correlate the lab and clinical into online didactic? Well, so I, I'm going to answer what I think you're asking. I apologize if, if, if I'm not. Okay. Did you see in my examples here, I used clinical tools as learning activities during lecture, okay? And, and you saw all those tools. And I used lecture tools, like the Nurse Think Notes, in clinical and lab as well. It's a two-way street. That, that three-by-five note card that we created early on when I was talking about cue recognition, we're using that in lecture, lab, and clinical. Why do we do this? We do this because the student is gonna learn better when we show them what they already are familiar or comfortable with, okay? The sooner we can get some familiarity and comfortableness or <laughs> comfort <laughs> into the mix here, the, the more permission they have to increase the higher order thinking also known as clinical judgment, okay? This is really important. I can't overemphasize this enough. When a student says clinical has nothing to do with lecture, what that means is that of everything they did in clinical today, they didn't recognize anything. You and I both know that your lecture was all over that clinical experience. So what do we do? We take a tool that they're using in clinical like med surge clinical companion like skills hub like that three by five note card and we use them in lecture now when they use that note card that clinical companion again that skills hub in the clinical experience they're going to it's going to trigger their memories of the clinical judgment exercises that you did during lecture that bridging that crossover is a key component to developing what we call in the concept-based world, enduring learning. And it's very, very important, especially with the way the NCLEX is going. You've got to promote that enduring learning by showing them that crossover. Does that help? I, I hope it does. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, the, the questioner said he, you, you answered his question. Okay. So, thank you. You bet. Um, one other question here. How do you get faculty on board with these types of teaching and learning strategies, and when will the next-gen NCLEX take effect? Okay, the best way to get faculty on board, I've had many discussions about this, and, and, and what I hear from schools that I work with nationwide, all types of schools, the number one strategy that helps you get, get, get your, your team on board is you guys come together and come up with a plan that you all can implement fairly easily and, and call it a pilot study, okay? So here's an example of a pilot study. Faculty, we all have this MedSurge clinical companion that we've adopted that the students have on their phones. Can we agree that in every lecture, no matter what the lecture is about, they're gonna get at least one patient assignment, okay? So that patient assignment might be patient at the end of a chapter in a textbook, they're going to get a patient assignment and they have to pull out their clinical companion and prioritize care for that patient 
based on what they see in that book, okay? Can we all do that just once a week for the next five weeks and then come back together and talk about how it went, okay? That's one example of how you get faculty on board with this because once they start seeing the power of this type of learning, it's gonna really help. Another way is deans, directors, coordinators, you ask, you ask, you say, okay, we, we agree that we have to have more clinical judgment, more taking action, more doing in every lecture. So what I'm gonna do faculty, we've got, we've got nine months of faculty meetings ahead of us. Woo, that's something to look forward to. Got nine months of faculty meetings ahead of us. I'm gonna assign each of you a faculty meeting. What I want you to do during your five minutes is turn us all into students and show us all an activity where the students are doing clinical judgment, not learning about it, not reading about it, not hearing you talk about it, but they're doing it. And this gives everybody buy-in because everybody knows they're gonna at some point have to present, they're gonna at some point have to share. It's a very powerful way to keep all the faculty moving in one direction. Sorry, I got long-winded. That's okay. Um... That's all the questions we have for today. Um, I just want to say thank you everyone for attending our webinar. If you have any questions on the solutions that were um, referenced in this webinar, you can email sales at skyscape.com. Some of the resources referenced in the web webinar were the Skills Hub app, which can be found in the app in Google Play stores. You can look at 25 free skills. Um, there's also a Saunders and Comprehensive Review for NCLEX bundle with the Nurse Think notebook. You can uh, go to skyscape.com and search Nurse Think for that. Um, more tips on the Nurse Think notebook, uh, go to nursethink.com. If you want to learn more about the offerings at Skyscape, um, go to skyscape.com slash education. This webinar will be available on demand in the coming days and we will email all attendees. If you have any additional questions, um, once you um, think about it or look at the webinar for a second time or any of your faculty, you can contact our sales department or email webinar at skyscape.com and we'll try to get those answered. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye.